So let's talk about two specific cases of SHM. First of all, we have ball on a string, and you've seen that already. We're also gonna be looking at mass on a spring. Now there are some people who claim that all physics can be summed up with balls on strings and mass on springs. And to be honest, they kind of write a heck of a lot of physics and the physical world relies on simple harmonic motion. Now, you don't need to know how to derive these. You're given these equations for the time period for each of these. The time period for a ball on a string, that's a, a pendulum, is equals to two pi times the square root of L, that's the length of the string over G. That's the gravitational field strength or the acceleration due to gravity, depending on what you want to call it. For a mass on a spring, it's similar because it starts with two pi times the square root of mass on the spring divided by the spring constant itself. So very similar equations, but quite different as well. Notice what this equation doesn't have in it, mass. That's weird, isn't it? It doesn't matter what mass the thing on the end has. The surface area does kind of matter in reality, but more on that later. But this could be a golf ball or it could be a car and it doesn't matter it would still have the same time period notice that it doesn't have an amplitude either so again it doesn't matter whether you displace the pendulum that much to begin with or that much to begin with it's going to have the same time period regardless that's why we have pendulums in some clocks like grandfather clocks they start off swinging a lot their amplitude is big over time their amplitude gets less but that doesn't actually affect the time it takes for that pendulum to swing but it does have G in, so it would change on a different planet because you have a different G. So what about the mass on a spring? We do have mass in this case, so the time period does depend on what mass you put on there, but it doesn't have G. And again, it has no amplitude, so it doesn't matter how far you pull down this mass from equilibrium, it's still gonna oscillate up and down with the same time period and the same frequency. So it doesn't matter what the gravitational field strength is, you could be in space where there's a G of zero you're still gonna have the same time period for a mass spring system. So how are these things proportional to each other? Well, two pi is a constant, so we can say that the time period is proportional to the square root of L over G. If G was constant, time period would be proportional to the square root of L. If the length was constant, then that would mean that T would be proportional to one over the square root of G. If you haven't seen my video on proportionality yet, go and have a look at that if you're unsure of how to deal with this kind of question. So here's a question. If the length of your pendulum doubles, how is that going to affect the time period? Well, we know that the time period is proportional to the square root of L, so that must mean that the time is gonna go up by a factor of root two. Let's have a go at another one. If G got weaker by a factor of four, what would happen to the time period? Well, here we have t is proportional to the inverse of the root of g, and we're dividing by four. If we're dividing by four, but that's square rooted, then that means ultimately we're dividing by two, but that's on the bottom, so altogether, the time period would go up by a factor of two. These kind of questions for pendulums and mass and springs crop up all the time in multiple choice in your exams. So it's worth getting ahead around the whole proportionality thing for these two equations. Same over here, time period is proportional to root m, or t is proportional to one over the root of the spring constant. Just one more question, let's have a go. If you had a spring, which is four times stiffer, what would happen to the time period? Have a go at it yourself. So if k is going up by a factor of four, that means that the square root is going up by a factor of two, but it's on the bottom, so that means that the time period is going to half. How can we find out g experimentally from the pendulum? Well, we do, as per usual, need a straight line graph. What are we going to put on these two axes to get a straight line graph? Let's have a look at our equation again. We can see that t is equals to this, but we want g ultimately. Let's rearrange this. I have t over two pi equals root over g, squaring the whole thing. I have t squared over four pi squared equals l over g. Flipping the whole lot and rearranging it, I end up with g equals four pi squared l over t squared. 
So what am I going to put on these axes here? I'm going to put L and I'm going to put T squared on there. I'm going to change the length of my pendulum and I'm going to measure the time period and I'm going to plot one against the square of the other. So to find out G, I do four pi squared times the gradient. What about the other side? Very similar to over here, we end up with T squared over four pi squared equals M over K in this case. If I want to find out K, this is rearranging this, I end up with K equals four pi squared times the mass over T squared. It's gonna give me four pi squared times the gradient. So what am I gonna put? I'm gonna put the mass here and I'm gonna put the time period squared down here. Now when you do these experiments, in both cases, you're going to take lots of readings. I would say take 10 or 20 oscillations. So let's say that we're doing 10 oscillations. It's worth having a fiducial marker, so a straight line with the pendulum, so you can see when it's crossing equilibrium, and the same thing with the mass and the spring, so you can see when it's passing that point. All you do is let the pendulum swing, or let the mass and spring go up and down, and then ready, and start, and that's zero oscillations. One, two, three, four, and you're gonna keep on doing that until you get to 10, and that gives you your time for 10 oscillations. Let's say that that took five seconds, so that means that your time period is going to be 0.5 seconds. Same thing with your mass and your spring. Let it oscillate. And then when it hits the midpoint, go zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10. That way you're drastically reducing uncertainties introduced due to human error. I hope you found that useful. If you did, then please leave a like. If you have any questions or think I've missed anything out that you'd like to see, then please leave it in a comment down below and I'll see you next time.